I was a man before I became a fighter. I don't stop being a man just because I'm a fighter now. You can run off at the mouth all you want, and that's okay. But don't try to hurt me. Then I gotta hit back. And you gotta pay. Reuben Carter was born May 6, 1937, into a family of seven children in Clifton, New Jersey. He didn't grow up in poverty or come from a broken home. Instead, they were a close-knit, success-oriented family. Carter's first opponent was his father, Lloyd Carter Sr., a deacon of a Baptist church and a stern disciplinarian. Lloyd once turned over the eight-year-old Reuben for shoplifting, stealing clothes he didn't need. Carter struggled in school, getting teased because of a speech impediment. He stated that his troubles worsened when his family moved to Patterson, New Jersey, where he joined a street gang called the Apaches. At the age of 11, Carter alleged that he was attacked by an older homosexual and had to stab him to defend himself. He was arrested and sent to the Jamesburg State Home for Boys. At the age of 17, he ran away from this reformatory, returning home to Patterson, but his family rejected him. His father called him a bad apple, sending him to Philadelphia, where a relative convinced him to join the army. After basic training, Carter was assigned to West Germany, where he became a member of the 11th Airborne Division and also began to box. He won 51 of 56 amateur fights, knocking out 38. He won the European service title, but was discharged for being unfit for military service after four court-martials for unruly behavior. Upon returning home, Carter found work as a truck driver, but remained a fugitive and was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. After his release, Carter immediately committed another crime, robbing an elderly woman at knife point. Why did I do it? Carter asked. I understand what prison life does to all of us, being forced to live while brutality runs rampant, without anyone coming to our rescue. The moment we are out, we strike back at a public that abandoned us. Carter served four years in Trenton State Prison, where he read as many books as possible on psychology, while dedicating himself to becoming a boxer. Carter turned professional in September of 1961, winning his first three fights before splitting a pair of decisions with the heavier Herschel Jacobs. In January of 1962, Carter signed with manager Carmen Tedeschi, a building contractor who provided him with a job at his company to help him make ends meet. Carter trained daily, sparring with veteran Randy Sandy as he learned the nuances of the sport under the guidance of his trainer, Tommy Parks. Tedeschi arranged for Carter to fight three opponents in a single night for charity. Carter knocked out all three, two of whom were heavyweights, with none lasting beyond the second round. Meanwhile, in the professional ranks, Carter's opponents fared no better, as he knocked out normally durable fighters with ease. He also expressed frustration with his home state of New Jersey's decision to implement 10-ounce gloves as a safety measure following the tragic death of Benny Perrette in the ring. I wasn't disturbed by his death, Carter said. This is a rough business. Others have been hurt and killed before, and it will happen again. In a way, it's God's business. Carter's ruthless attitude extended to his opponents as well. Before his bout with Mel Collins, Carter promised to, quote, bounce him off the canvas like a yo-yo. He backed up his words, flooring the veteran twice before the fight was stopped in the fifth round. Tedeschi, using his connections with Madison Square Garden executives, began booking Carter at the venue, leading to a televised bout against longtime veteran Florentino Fernandez in October of 1962. Here's the bout for round one. Both throws, swishing left hooks. Fernandez, of course, is the more experienced and has fought the better opponents. Each packs the kick of a mule in the left hand. As a rule, Fernandez needs punching room for his left hook. It's apparent this early that Carter can throw short punches and there with a the right hand.
The once iron-jawed Fernandez had never been knocked out cold. I don't know which is my best punch, Carter said. It all depends on the location of my opponent's head. Featherweight legend Willie Pep called Carter the hardest-hitting middleweight in the game, and the press began dubbing him Sonny Liston Jr. With his shaved head and Fu Manchu mustache, Carter had the intimidating look of a Barbary pirate. One of his psychological tactics was entering the ring wearing an oversized velvet robe. Because the robe was too big for him, it made him look small to his opponent across the ring. But when I do take it off, Carter said, my body suddenly looks so big to the other guy that I can see his eyes bulge clear across the ring. Carter had risen to the rank of number five among the world's middleweights. He was knocked down for the first time in his career by Holly Mims, but battled back to win a decision. Three months later, he secured another significant victory, dominating longtime veteran Gomio Brennan over 10 one-sided rounds. Carter had become so feared that finding opponents willing to face him became a challenge. Henry Hank was offered a fight but declined, citing that the lowest weight he could make was 168 pounds. Joey Giambra initially accepted a bout, but had a last-minute change of heart, telling matchmaker Tenny Brenner, quote, I will not fight that beast. Sugar Ray Robinson and George Benson were considered as potential opponents, but in March of 1963, Tedeschi chose the experienced and rough Jose Gonzalez. Though Carter was ahead on points, Gonzalez fought dirty, repeatedly headbutting and lacing Carter with his gloves. Carter suffered a cut over his eye in the second round, which Gonzalez targeted with his glove laces. He fights like a broken bottle, Carter said. The bout was stopped in Gonzalez's favor in the sixth round. It wasn't a loss, but a gain, Tedeschi said. My boy lost a bout, but saved an eye, and I still say he's going to be middleweight champion of the world. Tedeschi brought Charlie Goldman, the trainer of the legendary Rocky Marciano, onto Carter's team. Goldman, known for his keen eye, admitted that he found very few weaknesses in Carter's abilities. His balance was his biggest fault, Goldman said. That's what we're working on now. You can do a lot more things when you have the proper balance. Goldman brought in former opponent Holly Mims as a sparring partner, along with Joey Washington, a Philly fighter who not only resembled Carter's upcoming opponent, George Benson, but also mimicked his fighting style. Benson, a 14-year veteran, was vastly more experienced than Carter, who had only been in the game for three years. The odds makers made Benson an 8-5 favorite, predicting he would, quote, knock the eye out of the hurricane. One minute to go in round one. Ten seconds to go on round one. There's the back. Some good punches by Carter, some good defensive work by Benton. was uh, in trouble there for a moment as they mix over in Carter's corner. Ten seconds to go in round three. Benton. 
says that Carter still has his Mandarin type mustache. Benton would like to stand off and box, but Carter won't let him. He keeps crowded. Benton will warn for a little unusual headwork. Stay in boxing parlance. Maybe coming on a little now. One minute to go in round seven. Benton is crossing that right hand of his over the left glove of Carter now, and it's effective. That's what I said, Benton wasn't getting off, he's coming on. for Benton. Ten seconds to go in round seven. Two minutes left in round nine. to the attack. One minute to go in round nine. bombed away. Ken Todd of Patterson, New Jersey, 158 to black. Arthur McCanny, the referee, doing his usual fine job. Tenth and final round, there have been no knockdowns. Seemed to have the round one, and then he was shaken. Fifteen seconds. Everybody 
applauding. There's the final bell. Scoring in New York on a round basis with a supplementary point system if the rounds come out even. That's Carmine Tedeschi, his manager with Carter. We'll have the decision in just a minute. Here is the decision. Judge Leo Greenbaum scores a six to four, Carter. One vote, Carter. Judge Johnny Tran, seven, two, one even, Carter. Referee Arthur McCanty. The referee Arthur McCanty has a five, four, one even for Fenton. They win it by majority vote. Trainer Charlie Goldman, now at 75 years old and with five world champions to his name, boldly predicted that Carter would be a 6th, 7th, and 8th. He believed Carter had the potential to match Bob Fitzsimmons' legendary feat of winning the middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight titles. Carter has two things going for him, Goldman said. One of them is his right hand, the other is his left. I think he's the hardest hitter since Stanley Ketchell. With his success, Carter became flamboyant outside the ring. He cruised around in a Cadillac Eldorado with his name emblazoned on the side, and he wore shark skin suits. Promoter Jimmy Collado believed Carter, now ranked number two in the world, was due for a title shot. Carter secured a decision victory over Fareed Salim, but his momentum was halted by an upset decision loss to Joey Archer. Many ringside observers, including the Associated Press, had Carter as the winner, but the official loss temporarily derailed his chances at a title shot. Two months later, Carter had a chance for redemption when welterweight champion Emil Griffith stepped up in weight to fight him. Middleweight champion Joy Giardello had promised to defend his title against the winner. Now confident, even cocky with both opponents and the press, Carter believed no welterweight belonged in the ring with him. At the weigh-in, Carter confronted Griffith, saying, quote, You talk like a champ, but you fight like a woman who deep down wants to be raped. And the bout's over. And the count will continue from there and is floored at the bell. Carter in the white trunks, Griffith in the black trunks. Griffith, the well away champion whose title is not at stake, facing probably the hardest hitter he has ever faced in Reuben Hurricane Carter. Carter features the left hook. His right is pretty good and it's quick. He has no jab that we have seen so far. Griffith has all the equipment. A jab, short and long punches, good hooks, good right crosses, good defensive moves. Griffith facing a middleweight has won seven of his nine bouts with middleweight. He lost to Randy Sandy early in his career and to Denny Moyer, whom he defeated twice. Boys trading good leather here in round one. The winner of this fight could very well challenge for the middleweight title now held by Joey Giardello. You probably noticed that uh, down from the left hook. He's got to take the man at four, six, seven, eight. He just about beat the count. He just about beat it. And we have more than a minute to go on the ground. Carter is on him, and it goes Griffith down again. One minute to go in round one. Seven, eight, and he just about beat the count again. And the referee is Carter reportedly shouted, you got to pay the hurricane, as he knocked down Griffith to the canvas for the second time. The fight was later voted knockout of the year, and Carter demanded his shot at Joy Giardello. However, a falling out with manager Carmen Tedeschi led to Carter being suspended by the New York Ring Commission after he failed to attend three hearings regarding their contractual dispute in July of 1964. An arrest warrant was issued for Carter after he was involved in a brawl at a Patterson nightclub. Just three months later, he was arrested again after he and a friend assaulted the owner and a waiter at another nightclub. His temper is quick, longtime friend Elwood Tuck said of Carter. 
so quick, if you could just ease him over the next minute or so, then he cools and forgets it. To make matters worse, a profile of Carter in the Saturday Evening Post quoted him joking about shooting police officers. Now managed by Pat Amato, Carter finally received his title shot against Joy Giardello. Initially a 7-5 underdog, Carter became the 6-5 favorite by fight night. The bout was close, but Giardello dominated the final rounds, securing a unanimous decision. While Carter felt he had won, he admitted to holding back, worried about running out of gas, since it was his first 15-round fight. In January of 1965, a grand jury declined to indict Carter on the assault and battery charges at the nightclub. While Carter's legal troubles seemed temporarily behind him, his boxing career continued to decline. He floored the favored Luis Rodriguez but lost a clear-cut decision. In April of 1965, Carter traveled to England where he lost a controversial decision to Harry Scott. Manager Pat Amato called it the most disgraceful decision he had ever witnessed, as Carter had knocked Scott down and the British fighter required hospitalization after the bout. Returning to the US, Carter was arrested for shooting craps and resisting arrest. In May of 1965, he suffered his most decisive defeat, being knocked down three times by Dick Tiger and losing by decision. In subsequent fights, Carter appeared tired and listless in the ring, losing decisions to Johnny Morris, Stan Harrington, and Rocky Rivero, which caused him to drop out of the middleweight rankings. Further managerial disputes arose when Carter appeared to express a desire to re-sign with his former manager Carmen Tedeschi, prompting Amato to file a lawsuit for money he was owed. But Carter's boxing career came to an abrupt end in October of 1966, when he and his friend, John Artis, were arrested for a shooting that occurred on June 17th of that year. The two were charged with the fatal shootings of George Oliver, the 52-year-old part owner of the Lafayette Grill, and two patrons, Fred Nyux and Hazel Tannis. A fourth customer, William Marins, survived, but was severely injured and partially blinded. Tannis was found alive, having been shot four times with a 38 caliber pistol and once with a shotgun. Despite providing a description to a police sketch artist, her testimony never made it into the trial because authorities failed to obtain a deathbed declaration as they initially believed she would survive. According to reports, Tannis indicated that Artis hesitated before shooting her, prompting Carter to urge him on, saying, quote, finish her, finish her. Tannis's daughter later claimed her mother had identified both Carter and Artis from their mugshots. The trial was further complicated by Marins, the only survivor, but could not provide a clear account due to his impaired vision from the attack. Carter and Artis were questioned immediately after the slayings but later released. Their clothing was never tested for gunpowder or blood spatter. However, the duo and their car fit the description given by eyewitnesses Patricia Valentine, who lived above the bar, and Ronald Ruggiero. Valentine later testified that she saw two black men leave the bar and get into a white car with rear lights shaped like butterflies. Ruggiero stated that he heard shots, a screech of tires, and saw a white car shoot past with two black men in the front seat. Carter's rental car, a 1966 white Dodge Polara with New York plates, was impounded and two unfired rounds were discovered inside, one a 32 caliber bullet and the other a 12 gauge shotgun shell. But the weapons used in the murders were never found. It was believed that the possible motive for the murders was revenge. A few hours before the shooting, a black bar owner Roy Holloway was shot by Frank Conforti, the man from whom he had purchased the bar. It was initially reported that Holloway was Carter's uncle, which Carter denied, though he was a friend of Holloway's stepson. Two convicted thieves, Alfred Bellow and Arthur Bradley, saw two men exit the bar after the shooting. Bellow was initially hesitant to talk to the police, fearing that his brother, who was in state prison, might be attacked by Carter's friends. Bradley was also hesitant but eventually told detectives that the person involved had a lot of fans and his initials are RC. Four months after the initial interrogation, Carter and Artis were rearrested when Bello and Bradley changed their stories and identified Carter and Artis as the shooters. Bello later admitted he had been acting as a lookout during a robbery in the area. Carter wept after being formally charged. At trial, Bello testified that he saw two black men leaving the bar, laughing loudly. The shorter man was swinging a shotgun while the taller one had a pistol. Neighbors testified that they saw two black men run out of the tavern, but Bello was the only witness who identified the men as Carter 
and artists. The jury deliberated for six hours before returning a guilty verdict. Carter was sentenced to two consecutive life terms and a third concurrent term for the three murders. Artis received three life terms to be served concurrently. The case was appealed in 1969 on the grounds that Carter's rental car had been seized and searched without a warrant, but the New Jersey Supreme Court upheld the convictions. Carter passed the time in prison by writing. He had a short story, Return of the Kid, published, and then began work on his autobiography, which he titled The Sixteenth Round. In 1974, two of the chief witnesses, Bellow and Bradley, recanted their testimony, saying they had lied about Carter and Artis to save themselves from lengthy sentences. On the strength of their recantations, a new trial was sought. However, the judge believed that the two thieves changed their stories because they feared retribution from Carter, who had power and influence among inmates in institutions regularly frequented by Bellow and Bradley. Detective Vincent de Simone said that he had guaranteed Bellow protection and agreed to have him transferred to an area outside of Patterson, New Jersey. But Bellow told the detective, either you get me out of here or I'm going to tell Carter and Artis what they want to hear. In 1976, a second trial began. The Hawkins Report, created by Eldridge Hawkins, an investigator working on Carter's defense, cast doubt on the eyewitness testimony of Alfred Bellow. The report named Elwood Tuck and Eddie Rawls as the shooters. Rawls was the stepson of Roy Holloway, who had been shot hours before the Lafayette Grill slayings. Hawkins suggested that James Oliver, the part owner of the Lafayette Grill, might have been involved in illegal activities and that the murders could have been connected to organized crime. In 1975, new lawyers for Reuben Carter and John Artis requested a new trial, arguing that key evidence, such as the tape of Detective Desimone's conversation with Alfred Bellow, had been suppressed during the original trial. Carter's case garnered widespread attention, with numerous celebrities rallying to his cause, including Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, and Muhammad Ali. Dylan produced the song Hurricane, which depicted the injustice faced by a black man wrongfully accused by the police and an all-white jury. In March of 1976, the New Jersey Supreme Court ordered a new trial, leading to the release of both Carter and Artis on bail. Following his release, Carter received numerous offers for lecture tours, interviews, and endorsements. He also attended the Muhammad Ali-Jimmy Young fight, publicly thanking Ali for his unwavering support and efforts to raise funds for his legal defense. Let's talk about Muhammad Ali, because he's the story here tonight. Uh, Jimmy Young is a fighter, uh, but Muhammad Ali is something, uh, well, he's something really special. Muhammad Ali is a fantastic human being, but even more than that, Muhammad Ali is a correct thinking person, just as many other correct thinking persons, people in this country are finally realizing that only when people get together with other people will we solve the problems of people, and Muhammad Ali is that man. He's not only a fighter by profession, but he's a fighter by conviction. He knows right from wrong, and that's beautiful. Unusually in uh, many respects, uh, as a fighter, uh, Ruben, uh, you've seen the great ones, it's been your profession. Uh, how would you evaluate him? Of course, we're talking about 1976. So therefore, if we were living back in 1986, or 1886 or 1786 were well, the fighters of that time were the fighters of that time but we got to grow we got to keep on moving because a fool no, neither a wise man can see where they're going if they're always looking backwards at where they've been you see so muhammad ali is the greatest today right now and he has proved that and i think that he has shown that he loved himself so much and that's why everybody else loves him too he's the people's champ Reverend, thank you. You sounded a little bit like him. He said, uh, the jets outfly the propeller planes. He said, why am I not the greatest? Reverend, thank you for being with us. Thank Enjoy you, the Frank. fight. It was great to see you again. You. During this time, Carter faced accusations of assaulting Carolyn Kelly, the former coordinator of his defense committee. Kelly had gone to Carter's hotel room, and the two began arguing over his hotel bill. I was down on the floor, Kelly said. Carter had his hands around my throat and said he was going to kill me. Carter then called one of the security guards from Muhammad Ali's entourage, claiming the now unconscious Kelly had fallen in his room and needed assistance. Kelly was later hospitalized, but chose not to press charges. However, the incident led many celebrities to withdraw their support for Carter. The new trial began late in 1976. Authorities offered Carter a chance to take a lie detector test, but the former boxer 
refused. Alfred Bello once again reversed his testimony, siding with the prosecution. The prosecution portrayed Carter and Artis as two men on a drinking spree enraged by the murder of a black bar owner by a white man earlier that night. They argued that Carter and Artis entered the Lafayette Grill and shot everyone inside. Before sentencing, Carter delivered a 50-minute speech, insisting that he was not on trial for murder but for being black. The jury once again sided with the prosecution, handing down the same guilty sentences as in their first convictions. This time, the jury included two black members, but Carter dismissed their significance after the guilty verdict. They're old, Carter said. They don't even know what they are themselves. Carter returned to his cell at Trenton State Prison, maintaining a reclusive demeanor, rarely interacting with other inmates or guards. He refused to eat prison food, instead relying on canned goods brought to him by a benefactor, which he heated in his cell. By the 1980s, Carter's defense team shifted focus to filing a federal habeas corpus petition, arguing that he had been denied a fair trial. The petition emphasized that the prosecution had relied on racial bias and had withheld critical evidence. On November 7, 1985, U.S. District Judge H. Lee Sorokin ruled in Carter's favor. Sorokin found that the conviction had been based on an appeal to racism rather than reason and concealment rather than disclosure. His ruling vacated the 1976 conviction, effectively declaring that Carter and Artis had not received a fair trial. Although the prosecution had the option to retry the case, they chose not to, citing the challenges of prosecuting a case nearly two decades old. On November 8, 1985, Carter was released from prison and relocated to Canada thanks to the support of a group of benefactors. In 1999, director Norman Jewison produced a film based on Carter's life called The Hurricane. The movie, starring Denzel Washington, depicted Carter's rise as a boxer, his arrest, struggles in prison, and the legal battles that eventually led to his release. However, the film took liberties with historical facts including the creation of a fictional racist detective and a false portrayal of Carter losing a fight to middleweight champion Joey Giardello due to biased judges. Giardello later sued the producers for defamation and won a settlement. After his release, Carter dedicated his life to heading a nonprofit organization called Innocence International, which advocated for wrongfully convicted individuals. Carter passed away on April 20, 2014, at the age of 76 after battling prostate cancer. Barbara Burns, the daughter of Hazel Tannis, one of the victims in the Lafayette Bar shooting, remained outspoken about Carter and the film that portrayed him as a hero. They fabricated the facts to make money, Burns said, and made a hero out of a cold-blooded murderer.